It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with May Russell. For the past 14 years, May has been researching and uncovering facts and evidence from between the lines of the news and placing them in a more thorough perspective of how conspiracy, political assassination, and abuses of power affect us all. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. And now, May Russell. Evening. This is May Russell. This is Carmel, California, and it is Sunday evening. It's April the 23rd, 1978, and it's Dialogue Conspiracy number 318. I do want to talk about the series on television this last week, The Holocaust, NBC, The Four Nights. And, of course, those of you that listen to Dialogue Conspiracy Weekly for the past, it'll be seven years this coming May, the overriding theme of the entire research that I have done is on the Nazification of the United States after World War II and the origins of our political assassinations, terrorism, and the intent to install the Fourth Reich all over the world. I became conscious of the links to the Nazis in Germany when I started cross-following the Warren Commission hearings and realized that the companions of Lee Harvey Oswald were also associated with Heinrich Himmler and Walter Dornberger, the Nazi war criminal in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and my concern has been the Nazification of America, and I became aware of this at least 12 years ago. Um, if you want information on the Holocaust and you have a pencil, if you don't have a pencil and I give it too fast, write to me. And if you have one handy, which I hope you do when you listen to these shows, uh, write this down. Uh, send to uh, the Anti-Defamation League in Los Angeles, Anti-Defamation League, Suite 6505 Wilshire Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90048. They have a 16-page newspaper on the Holocaust that was inserted in the Los Angeles Times and the um, New York p newspapers and in Washington. There were quite a few newspapers that had this 16-page uh, new insert, and it's a very good factual documentation with a lot of information on the 16 pages, and there's no use uh, spending the half hour on Dialogue Conspiracy reading some of it to you. I'll just give a little bit of it to you, but you can have it and uh, keep it and maybe set a contribution of 50 cents or whatever, or postage, and ask the Anti-Defamation League, Suite 6505 Wilshire Boulevard, Los Angeles, 90048, for facts about uh, the Nazi process in Germany because you can't understand the news today unless you understand the past history and a lot of the information is there. I also ordered and mentioned once on the program a four-volume book called Doctors of Death and again you can write to me with a self-addressed stamped envelope because I can't keep addressing and stamping all of this mail but if you have a self-addressed stamped envelope and you don't have a pencil I'll give you this on a bibliography these are four volumes that I'm reading right now. I'm into volume three. Uh, they're put out by an organization called Friends of History, 4721 Couture, C-O-U-T-U-R-E Boulevard, Montreal, P-Q, province of Quebec, I guess that is H-I-R-3-H-7. Four volumes of Auschwitz and the concentration camps, how they got started, and a lot about the experimentation, the doctors that were charged with crimes, the ones that got away, like Dr. Mengelis, who went down to Brazil to continue his medical experimentations. It's a fantastic book called Doctors of Death, and I think the theme of this book is so important to the research that I'm doing, and I'll go into this further this evening and next week and continuously is that we have to get the government out of the medical business. Our government is in the medical uh, business right now. Uh, there were memos in the Howard Hughes Hotel at the time he passed away, and I'm sure there were many before, saying uh, escalate or keep up the Hughes Medical Institute in Miami because medicine is the fourth biggest industry in the United States. And there are fronts, CIA, DIA, Defense Industry um, Agency, the NASA, National Security Agency, Navy Intelligence, Army Intelligence. There are fronts for experimentation that have been going on since World War II with Nazi doctors and people working with the Nazis 
And we'll go into those. I've mentioned them at different times singly. Uh, I've isolated the most dangerous institutions, and I'll print those out for you if you want a list of them. One is the Hughes Medical Institute in Miami, Florida. The other is Dr. Oshner's Cancer Clinic in New Orleans, Louisiana. The George Washington Hospital, run by Dr. Murdoch Head and the Arley Foundation, which is a CIA, DIA front for population and mass extermination control that is just in the news lately, and we'll be doing more on that. The Rockefeller Medical Institute in New York that has been working on the uh, genes and the uh, experiments with the genes, and then they sent their head doctor down to the Hughes Institute experimenting with mutations and that type of activity, the DNA. Stanford Medical School linked to the Hoover Library and the Tsarist Nazis and Stanford University with their genetic germ mine research, the UCLA School for the Study of Violence, headed by Jolly West of the CIA, the use, uh, CIA Connections and at UCLA, the Alcohol, Drug, Abuse, and Mental Health Administration in Washington, D.C., with their chemicals, radiations, and poison, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, that will control not only garden plots where uh, they plan to take over the United States in case of a national emergency, but the swine flu, the viruses, the um, uh, Legionnaire's disease, and all the various uh, so-called unexplained diseases are being uh, reported down there. We have to dismantle the federal government control, the federal center for disease control and break up all medical research into private doctors, privately trained individuals, and get the government out of the medical business, or you will see Auschwitz and Dachau uh, pummeling in this country, which they're doing right now and planning to do. The Food and Drug Administration in Rockville, Maryland, and the new Houston, Texas Medical Center um, that in, uh, it's been getting a lot of publicity down there in Houston, Texas. Bethesda, Maryland, the Navy Hospital, and such... Navy hospitals is where Mrs. Ford is now, Gerald Ford's wife, for drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, I believe that she was a possible suicide or a poisoning case. And that's what uh, Jerry Ford is being counseled for, for his wife there. I don't think it's drugs from arthritis. I think they've tried to do a Martha Mitchell job on her or she was going to be done in because of her witness to Korean payoffs that are opening up now and the John Kennedy assassination. I think Betty Ford has been an important conduit or a behind the scene woman, I think that uh, going to the Navy hospital down there is something that we should question. I think our public officials can use private doctors and that they would get care in this way. We don't know what they're getting in the Navy and Army hospitals. As I say, the important thing I'm learning from the four volumes of Doctors of Death was to take the federal government out of the medical business. And this is one of the things that was emphasized at the Nuremberg trials for the doctors on experimentation. In Nazi Germany, there were 350 doctors that actually committed illegal crimes out of 90,000 German doctors. Uh, there's a song that Neil Diamond sings called Mary Magdalene, which is a very beautiful song. And he talks about so, there's certain people on one hand who are spiritual or philosophical, and there's people on the left who nothing ever happens for them, that never they have candles unlit. He says nothing really goes off for them well. And then there's the people in between. And it's a beautiful song, asking for help for the people in between. And that's where all of us sit who aren't activists, who aren't doing anything to change society. Those 90,000 German doctors in Germany that did nothing, all of them knew what was happening. 350 were mentioned as committing medical crimes, but the other 90,000 knew every single thing and went in collusion of silence. The people in between make the 350 possible. It's the 90,000 that were silent that made the 350 do what they did. So as I say, the federal government should be out of the medical business. In the Nuremberg trials, the qu point came up, and this is a quote. They said the basic tenet is that it is the doctor's own personal responsibility to man and society. He must ensure that the doctor have complete independence. This is from the Nuremberg trial. And yet, the Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Oshner's Cancer Clinic in New Orleans, the George Washington Hospital, headed by Dr. Murdoch Head, the Rockefeller Medical Institute, the Stanford Medical Institute, the UCLA School, 
with their electrode implants, their plans to put electrodes and transponders into people, the Washington Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration, the Atlanta, Georgia Center for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, Rockville, Maryland, the Houston, Texas Medical Center, the Arley Foundation, headed by Mr. Head, Bethesda Hospital and these Army Hospitals, and also the Boston Hospital, where Dr. Mark and Sweet began the electrode implants to turn people into zombies with money from Navy Intelligence and Health Education and Welfare, put up by Mr. Richardson and others. Uh, these are the centers, the 12 or 13 centers that I have fingered now that are proceeding with what I call the medical Nazification of America. Because Auschwitz and Dachau and the concentration camps were run by medical doctors. Hitler sent them to these places. Himmler and Goering and Goebbels sent them there. But men in white coats and uniforms ran the place. Medical doctors were behind the experimentations. So if you want to order these four books, Doctors of Death, I think it's $13.50 I paid. I gave you the address, or you can write to me again for it. There's another book out now that I'm reading called Inside the Fourth Reich, uh, The Real Story of the Boys from Brazil. It's by Eric Erdstein and Barbara Bean. And uh, there's a sentence in there. There's many good things. It said, would you believe that 20 years later, after the Holocaust, Martin Bormann and Joseph Mengele were still there plotting a Nazi revolution? There's another good book called The War Against the Jews by Lucy Dowaditz, the years from 1933 to 45. There is no end to the list of books you can get about the Holocaust. And if you order that uh, small newspaper from the Anti-Defamation League, there's a long bibliography of books. It isn't a question of the lack of information. It's a question of you being able to apply it to today and not look at NBC and say that was then. The big question is, who is alive of those groups today and what are they doing? Uh, the subject of the Nazis has been always on my mind, and when I lecture at colleges and various organizations, I always have a bibliography of uh, suggested books to read to follow up on some of the things I say. And I have a list um, that I have reproduced, you know, copied and handed out to everyone in the audience. And it isn't coincidental that the six sources that I give on this bibliography for information of then and now, because as I say, that is the important thing, checking the then and comparing it to the now. Those things have to do with the Nazification of America, those Germans that are alive today and those Germans that work with mind control, germ experimentations in our legal systems, uh, their coroners around the country, their doctors at the institutions. And uh, in order to stand, understand the present, we go to the past. And the heading that list, the bibliography, the very first book is Clarence Lansby's book, Project Paperclip. It's put out by Athenium Press. And I have a description of the importation of 652 Nazi specialists into our armament factories, universities, War industry, space programs, ITT, General Motors, and the U.S. corporations that finance Hitler brought the Nazis to America. The second book is Goodrich's book, Galen's Spy of the Century, put out by Random House in 1971, which I describe as Galen, Hitler's chief of intelligence of the Eastern Division, came to the United States, then went back to Europe, where he received $200 million from Alan Dulles, an attorney representing the Rockefellers and the Fords and the General Motors, the huge corporations, making deals to turn the OSS into the CIA based upon the way it worked in Nazi Germany, illegally rearming it from World War I to World War II. And then a third thing on my list are my three articles in The Realist, Why Was Martha Mitchell Kidnapped, The Senate Select Committee's Part of the Cover-Up, and Why Was, Martha Mich Why was Patri Patricia Hearst Kidnapped, because those three articles are an umbrella overview from the assassinations and the Nazi regime to Richard Nixon's importing Nazis and being put into office like Hitler was by the same people up through terrorism, which go is going to be the excuse to take away our civil rights. It was used in Germany. It's being used now. And the kidnapping of Patricia Hearst was to set up an American terrorist type of operation with SWAT teams to get ready and take over this country. The fourth uh, suggestion on the list is to write to Dr. Peter Bragan, and his address is on this list if you want the bibliography. Get his tape cassettes, um, they're on tape, or his books, 
Psychosurgery, Psychiatry and the Nazis and the Politics of Psychosurgery. The fifth uh, name on the list, which I mention often, is Freedom Magazine in Los Angeles, California, put out by the Scientologists, the National Commission of Law Enforcement and Social Justice, with the links of the Interpol and FBI and the Nazis. And then the last one is an article in Harper's Magazine, December 1974, by Jim Hogan on Intertel. A surfeit of spies. Where are retired FBI, CIA, Pentagon, NSA uh, employees go to form a secret army behind the Summa Corporation and the Hughes Organization? Uh, you can send for this information. If you don't have it, write to me, and I'll give you the addresses for all of it if you don't have it. And then you can read, and it will sort of be a guideline for past programs we've done on Dialogue Conspiracy and certainly for the future. Now, in the movie Holocaust on television, uh, the line came up, one of the lines in the show was, why doesn't somebody say no to them? And that's a very good line. But the line came out in the concentration camp when they realized that their lives were over and they looked at each other and said, why doesn't somebody say no? It's too late when you're rounded up. It's too late then to do anything. The time is now. We have FM radio, we have AM radio, we have tape cassettes and books. You have umpteen researchers uh, flooding the market with information. And there was another line in the play that the, it's the apathy that's going to kill them. And it's the apathy here. There's no way that I can wake you up or make you believe if you don't want to believe. And I think one good thing about that show was that it reached half the population in the United States, 100 million people. And I know even in my own family, my two daughters watched it, and they hear me talking this kind of the Nazi, warning about the Nazis, worrying about them, and they see the library I have and the articles I've written, they've read. But seeing the movie on television affected them differently than intellectually reading it on a page. Even if Dakar or Auschwitz look like Carmel Valley, according to one woman who was there, she called it a talk show, there's still something that made them have headaches and stomach aches and stomach cramps. The reality of it being acted out was very important for the American people to see, and even someone who's as close to it as my family. There was another line in there. It said, maybe love got us in trouble in the first place. We were too trusting, and we loved each other. And I think a lot of that is true, that we uh, do not think in terms of conspiracy. People are not conspiratorially minded. They don't think that anybody wants to do them in because they don't want to do anybody in. And you don't sit home and think about making furniture out of somebody's bones. But there's a man in San Francisco who's selling through Macy's and making furniture out of bones today. And you don't think of lampshades made out of skin. Uh, but somebody is thinking about it. And the question is, as long as somebody is thinking about it, you don't have to hate those people, but you can certainly stand up and get information. And if you trust people that come up front and tell you what they're going to do, even when they tell you, then you're in trouble. In 1935, the New York Tribune carried an article, September, it was September the 15th, 1935, and this is what it said. It said, there's stringent new laws in Germany now depriving Jews of all rights of German citizenship. It was decreed last night at the Reichstag by an address of Chancellor Adolf Hitler. The swastika will now be the symbol of the world, the sole national flag of the Reich. Under the new statutes, Jews are going to put, be put back abruptly to their position in the Middle Ages. This is in 1935. It said new Jewish laws go into effect January the 1st, 1936. No marriages between Jews and Gentiles. No Jews can fl hang the swastika flag. No servants under 45 years of age that are non-Jews. If you break the laws, you go to prison. And then it said there are definite indications that Adolf Hitler is preparing to go much further with the elimination of all Jews in Germany as the ultimate aim. Now, that was in September 1935, um, that edict went. I know myself, my family took us on a trip. We were going to Europe. And we took a trip around the world in 1936. We traveled. All this was going on in Europe, but I was oblivious to it. My parents didn't tell me. I was raised in Beverly Hills, went to Beverly High. Uh, we, we went on a trip around the world where there was war breaking out, all these different countries, but the continent of Europe was something my family didn't talk to me about, except that we were the last American family, I believe, in Spain. It was bombed when we were in Madrid at the hotel there. The revolution was starting there. 
And we got out, but the continent of Europe was filled with riots, so we didn't go to France that trip. I'd been there before. But I wasn't told why I didn't go to France. We just thought they were rioting over some labor thing. We didn't realize that the Holocaust was beginning or anything about that. A Jewish family raised to go on a tour, take a trip around the world and have fun and do all the little deck games and do all the little happy things and live in these resort hotels on the fringe of the violence. And yet here was the New York Tribune in 1935 talking about the elimination of all Jews. And my Jewish family was floating around. And that's one reason I'm doing this research is for my children. They may not appreciate it. And they may, but I'm doing it for my family and your family, and I don't want them to grow up stupid like I grew up stupid. There was another line in the movie at NBC, The Holocaust. It says, somebody asked Mr. Eichmann, how can you do such a good job with so little help? There weren't very many Germans helping him. And you know what he said? He said, it's easy because the Jews help us. And I think in the 14 years of research that I've done of how many Jews have actually helped the Nazification in this country and the people get into power. There's a new book out by a Jew named Alan Weinstein, Perjury it's called, which is a falsification of the Alger his story, and he writes it gladly. Louis Neiser, a Jew, wrote the introduction to the Warren Report and covered up the Nazis that worked with Lee Harvey Oswald and tried to make Oswald a deranged person. Judge Kaufman, a Jew, was used to give the death penalty to Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, even though he was working with the FBI, illegally forcing the testimony of two witnesses to connive at the time of the prosecution, even though they didn't agree on the same story, and the name Julius wasn't involved down at the atomic base. Roy Cohn, another Jew from the House Un-American Activity, uh, working with Richard Nixon, helping to prosecute the Rosenbergs, and then his co-partner, David Shine, I know the family and they're related to my father's associate, owns the Ambassador Hotel where Robert Kennedy was killed, where every door could have been covered with a killer. Co-partner Shine helping cover up the murder of Robert Kennedy and putting in these Nazis into power in Los Angeles when that uh, murder took place. Judge Hoffman, the Jew, sitting at Chicago conspiracy trial with those monkeys, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, Jews, some more Jews. I'm as anti-Semitic about the traitors among the Jews as I am about the Jews in Germany that sold the Jews down the river. Because I know a lot of these German Jews and their snobbery, and if they're accepted by a certain group of people, uh, prominent Gentiles, to win their favor, they'll do anything to sing and dance, and they're not even in the concentration camps yet. Bernard Weissman, the Jew at the time John Kennedy was killed, uh, they asked him why he put his name on an ad that was paid by the Birch Society's um, the, day, the black border wanted for treason. And he, he worked with Nazis that hated Jews, uh, German military intelligence that came to the Dallas-Fort Worth area with the most anti-Semitic people in the world. He said they used my name because they wanted a Jewish name. That's Bernard Weissman. Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. He was working with members of the Birch Society. He'd been at the office of E. Howard Hunt a few days before John Kennedy was killed. When he shot Lee Harvey Oswald, this primary witness to the assassination of John Kennedy, and they say, why did you do it? He said, I wanted to show them a Jew had guts. So they dared an insecure, insignificant man who'd been an informer for the FBI and the CIA gunning, running guns for the mafia to Cuba a low-level uh, man of the worst sort who wants the approval of the Gentile community to be somebody to have a Playboy nightclub in the Gentile community to lose his Jewishness. So he says, I want to show him a Jew had guts. And then another Jew, Edward J. Epstein, writes a book now about Lee Harvey Oswald and the KGB serving the international Nazis, covering up this story. And I go on and on and on. But our whole Cold War period has been used. The Jews have been used themselves, and they have to know better, and they, there's no excuse for what they're doing, except they make money, they get their judgeships, they write books, they're in prominence around the country. I can understand a, a Gentile doing this if he's anti-Semitic, because another line in this movie was, anti-Semitism is the glue, the cement that binds us together. They said, how can you get away from with this? You have no op Where's your opposition? in the movie The Holocaust and NBC, and the line was, anti-Semitism is the cement that binds us together from France to Russia, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, Yugoslavia, you name it. It was the hatred 
of the Jew because of his refusal to accept Jesus Christ as the sole Lord or as his Lord and only want him as a person that uh, causes these people to want to do the things they did. I hit some times on the Mormons, and I'm going to do a show about the Masons and assassinations, and the Jesuit priests have been a big conduit of removing Nazis from Europe and the Nazification of this Fourth Reich that's going to come down. But the point is that the Jews have been used, and they didn't have to be used. They, they could have made a living in this country, even they just pushed apples and had some self-respect. But I'm talking about Jews after World War II, for no excuse, working with these people and playing the role. And that's why Eichmann can say, when they say, how did you do such a good job? He could say, it's easy, because the Jews help us, and they do. I know in my own family, when I've talked about the links of these Nazis, the assassination, my own brother, who's vice president of E.F. Hutton, stock exchange, laughed and said to me quite a few years ago, well, when they come to take us away, I can always say, May told us. I feel very angry about these people, and I disassociate myself usually from them, and I am friends with all kinds of people, as long as they're tuned into what's happening. And they make some effort to change it, whether it's a letter to the editor or um, calling talk shows or reading books or publishing articles and books and uh, sending material to committees to investigate these crimes. As long as they're active in some way in trying to stop that disease, that social disease known as fascism, I associate with people. But there are groups, as I say, in among the Masons, the Jesuits, the Jews, uh, the Mormons, that are hell-bent on a total Fourth Reich, and wherever I can, I expose them, and I'm glad to do it. Uh, there was a Jewish child in the NBC movie Holocaust, a daughter that was sitting and studying, and the radio was on about the uh, invasions and the things coming down, the edicts in Germany and what was going to come down, and the family, the Dr. Weiss's family is sitting there, and the radio is talking about now, the news now. And the little girl is sitting there, the daughter who later is going to be burned alive, taken off to a house or gassed in that little house. And the father looks at her and he says, it's good that you keep preparing your lessons. In spite of everything, you must prepare yourself for life. And that is the uh, strange thing that we have around us, is the unreality of it, life was what was happening on the radio, not what he was teaching her in the books. Life wasn't back in Greece. It wasn't with Roman history. It wasn't with learning her sentence structure. Her life was on the radio, and he's not listening to the radio, but they're reading the books. And I think of myself, when I went to Stanford in 1940 to 1943, we learned art and music and literature, and that was what we were supposed to learn. You know, educated men and women went to Stanford University. We didn't turn on the war news. We didn't even know or admit what was happening. And yet the newspapers were filled with it. In 1934, the headlines, German papers talk about the purge of the Jews. In May 11, 34, Goebbels was warning to the Jews. The United Press, in 1941, all Jewish children over six were to be labeled. The Associated Press, in 1939, Jewish refugees sent to Havana, Cuba, and then turned back. The New York Times, 1938, the night of the broken glass of pogroms, the killings, and the destruction of the communities and towns. In 1939, the Jews were trying to leave Germany and couldn't get out, and I was just about ready to go to Stanford next, the next year. We'll be doing a lot of shows on the Holocaust. If you want to send... For the literature, write to me, self-addressed envelope. I'll give you the names of the books and the organizations. And then, as I say, we will continuously bring it up to the present because that really is the purpose of Dialogue Conspiracy. Our time is up now. I'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. Take care. And this is May Brussel in Carmel, California. You've been listening to Dialogue Conspiracy with May Brussel. 